obviously my story starts with the game of football. Um, it is something that I'll always remember for the rest of my life. It gave me the opportunity to really get my foot in the door with some business folks. So really, um, just to continuously expand my horizon, um, knowing that the game was going to come to an end. I'm very fortunate that I had the people around me at the time that I did, but obviously that's not the entire story. Um, I did struggle, I'm very open about it, struggled with alcoholism. Once I got to college at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the way that it came about was for me, I sort of lived my life in a fishbowl is what it felt like to where my social anxiety was getting the best of me, which obviously created a slippery slope with depression, self-medication with alcohol and ego as well. My ego didn't allow for me to really open my eyes and see the red flags. Um, and so I kept charting down that path until I crashed into a wall. I had the opportunity to play for my favorite team growing up. I grew up a different Broncos fan my entire life. I obviously went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, continued to play football, excelled at a high level, and was drafted by my favorite team. And uh, something that I'll never forget, John Elway called me, a 303 number. I jumped up, started hitting my dad, hitting my mom. Tears started flowing because it said Denver, Colorado, and I knew, and I knew. And obviously it was Elway who, uh, answered the phone and I said, yes, I would love to be a Bronco. And so I'm very fortunate to have accomplished my dream, but um, it, it was very challenging. We all understand the perks that come with playing at the highest level um, in your profession. Uh, when we talk about sports, of course, yes, the money is there, the fame, the lights, the cameras, the action, all of the above is fun, it's great, but it does come with a price. And for me, it was something that I wasn't uh, familiar with. Um, I struggled with it in college. And obviously once I got to the next level, it was just more temptations. I always love to say going from not being able to afford a plane ticket to now being able to go anywhere on the planet, um, I dove head first into that. Every time that I share my story and talk with youth, I always make sure to let them know that you have to understand who the folks that you're hanging around with, the habits that you're creating, and also create a plan for whenever you do run into a wall because it will happen. So for me, once I got to the NFL, I did not have a plan for when my depression was going to come back. And it did. In 2014, whenever I got injured and placed on IR, so I tore my groin off the bone and that really showed me that, wow, this can come to an end. When you do get on that journey of, of wanting to play a professional sport, for some odd reason, you, you just believe that it's never gonna come to an end. And so that is something that I just never came to terms with, never accepted it. So whenever I tore my groin my second year in the NFL, my alcoholism increased, why? because I only had to do two hours a day of PT, physical therapy at the stadium, and that was it. Then I had so much free time, and I, I, the way that I utilized it was partying and drinking. I was going from drinking three days a week, now I'm drinking five to six days a week. Um, and not just having a beer here and there, I was getting intoxicated. But again, my ego wouldn't allow for me to, to really go and speak to somebody about it, because I just kept telling myself, I'm just doing what everybody else is doing not really understanding that it was impacting me in different ways. There's two two tracks here, right? Some folks get the help um, on their own, right? Autonomy is a powerful tool. Some people can utilize it that way. For me, I was forced. I was forced. The moment that my feet touched the floor in jail, uh, when I spent a weekend in jail, um, because at that moment, the Denver Broncos released me in 2015 in September, and my ego was at its highest. Now my ego was bruised. My face was all over New York Times saying Monte Ball released from the Denver Broncos and I still wanted to prove to folks that I'm still this mighty, you know, I'm this football guy, this football player on top of everything. And so I took it out on somebody very close to me and I paid the price for it, rightfully so. And so I spent three days in jail and the moment that my feet touched that cold floor, I was like, I, this is not where I'm supposed to be. May it be God, may it be whomever it may be. Um, while I was in jail, I watched the Denver Broncos beat the Panthers in the Super Bowl. I watched while I sat in jail, then beat the Broncos and the other folks around me, the inmates were saying, that's supposed to be you up there. You're supposed to be a role model for us. And that really hit me pretty hard. So the moment I got out, my mom was crying. Um, she sat on the floor and was tearing up and crying and, 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 and forced me into IOP. And I never looked back. I would not have been able to do it without the help of therapy. I understand that there are a million ways up the hill, right? But for me, I'm a huge advocate on therapy. That worked for me the first time, which I understand is rare, but it did. I had a great connection with my therapist. I still see him today, one time a month now, obviously uh, compared to twice a week before. My therapist is very open about his story. He struggled with uh, cocaine. Um, he was in a rock band, toured with Metallica and all that stuff. So we kind of had this connection of the lights, cameras, action. So I would say my therapist really helped me to 
have a change in perspective where it was, this is not something that you allowed to happen. This is just something that you didn't understand was happening. I was playing the woe is me card at first, um, trying to play victim, trying to just explain myself instead of just taking ownership. And then once I did take that ownership, I would say I give the credit to myself, of course, but also my therapist where it's, this was something that was in your genes. You know, my father is in recovery as well, 23 years sober from alcohol, my dad. And my grandfather passed away, paternal grandfather passed away from alcoholism. Um, so again, not blaming anyone else for the direction that I went down, but painting the entire picture helped me to digest it better. In our communities of color, um, we do understand the health disparities, right? We understand that there's just not a lot of avenues for people of color in regards to treatment, in regards to education surrounding treatment, and also literacy surrounding insurance. It is no secret. In our communities, we do not talk about it. In our communities, we don't trust um, white doctors. We do not trust white therapists. But with that said, I will say that we are seeing progress. And for me, that is a mission of mine. I understand at Sandstone Care, yes, we open the door for anyone, but I would love to see more black and brown folks trust the process and understand that, yeah, we may not look like you. Um, obviously I know that I do, but a majority of us may not, but we are still here to help. So I am a clinical outreach ambassador at Sandstone Care. So business development is what I focus on. Um, obviously creating a stronger network in Colorado. But outside of that, what I really enjoy doing, because I, I enjoy that as well, but I love talking to families. I love talking to mom and dad. I love talking to the client as well, because we're talking about really crisis situations and I understand it. I do understand it. I was, I was there. I was literally there. I know what it's like. I know how it feels. I know what you may be thinking. And so I think when I do have these conversations with folks and I share a little bit about myself when they ask, I think that allows for them to take a little bit of pressure off their shoulders. Like, okay, this is someone that understands it. This is someone that gets it. This is someone who knows that, yeah, I don't have to do this. I can continue to unravel and, and go down the dark path, but here's an option for you. Here's an option that he may have chosen. And this is just a, a route that you can go. So for me, it's more so of just service is what I love, right? That reinstills my recovery. But also it doesn't really feel like work, man. It doesn't feel like a job when you are going about your day helping folks to rather get off a drug or to talk to a professional about what's going on in their life. The biggest one is there, there's no judgment. And I think this proves it right here. Um, many folks, and the way that I go about my life, I understand that some folks will not will, will never like me for the rest of my life, and, and I respect that. I understand that Sandstone Care did not have to go out on a limb and extend an olive branch to hire me. I understand that. But I think this speaks volumes about the character, the culture here at Sandstone, where it's if you are struggling with an addiction, you can come out of it, and we can help you. Mm -hmm.